Anyway, so I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Those there watching on live stream there, I apologize for that. I always forget to close the window on live stream there before we begin the air here. And uh, the live stream title is going to be a little different than what's going to be on YouTube. I, I, I'm thinking at the moment anyway, I actually speak about the proof of the temple, the third temple being built on the Temple Mount. And, uh, but what we're really getting into in this particular broadcast has to deal with more of Psalm 83, the confederacy that is going on with the Islamic nations and the Vatican, etc., as they build this covenant. But the reason why I chose this title is because of a very unique statement that is made in the video that is on your screen right now behind you here. This is uh, Al Masayid al, uh, at the Al Aqsa, uh, excuse me. This is uh, at the Al-Aqsa Mosque here, and uh, 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 it is a mosque preacher, uh, and uh, we're going to get into what he says here in just a few minutes, but he actually gives away the fact that they are actually planning to build the third temple in between or on the side of the Dome of the Rock. Uh, and that's something that I thought was very interesting, but another thing that I find interesting is this also goes to show the, um, the, the, the Confederate work that is being done behind the scenes with Rome and other Arabic countries there to annihilate the Jewish people, or at least in their minds they're going to annihilate the Jews uh, and push them completely out of Israel. Uh, the Vatican is using this in order to um, forge its own ideas and getting control of Jerusalem. Um, again, I didn't get all of the different uh, articles that I would love to have in putting this together. But I want to start with this right here. The title here on uh, palwatch.org is, um, uh, it says, Al-Aqsa Mosque Preacher, Jews will worship the devil and then be exterminated by Muslims who will live in comfort, as he states here. Uh, I will read to you while it plays here in the background for you guys here. Um, he says here, uh, the children of Israel will be forced. Um, let me back it up here. I don't want to miss this here. I'm looking at the wrong thing there. Uh, the children of Israel will be forced, they will not succeed. They will be forced to change their plans to build the temple inside the structure of the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Did you guys see that? I, I know you guys can see this clearly on your screen there now. He said to build the temple inside the structure of the Al-Aqsa Mosque. There has never been more clear proof the Palestinian people, the so-called Arabic people that call them, that have been given the name by Rome as Palestinians, are claiming right here, he's at the Al-Aqsa uh, Mosque right now, he's preaching to a group of men there inside Al-Aqsa Mosque there, and he is saying to build the temple inside the structure of the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Now he's talking about they're on the Temple Mount, and he's going to go a little bit more into it. So let's, let's take a little closer look at what he says here. And we'll have to build it outside. Let me back it up. It keeps jumping too quick on me there. Uh, and we'll have to build it outside the Al-Aqsa Al Mosque. Okay? A temple of heresy to worship the devil, he claims. Why, he says. All right? Uh, so he continues on, and he states uh, next, because the Antichrist won't appear. Okay? unless this temple is built and the devil is worshipped there. I, I'm going to tell you something. He's actually got some true facts right there. Because Satan does want to be worshipped as if he is, were God, sitting in the temple, uh, you know, sitting in the temple of God, being uh, exalted above all that is called God. Is that not right? Is that not what Satan's desire was? He said that he would uh, raise his, uh, his place up in the north. And he, would, he wanted to be like God, worship as if he were God. You know, the Pope of Rome, they're the ones that want to get the third temple built in Israel. Turkey is behind it. We're seeing other nations that, uh, that, that have actually uh, agreed on building the third temple. And this man here believes that it has to happen in order for the Antichrist to come on the scene. Let's look at more of what he has to say there, okay? So... So we see that he says that the uh, he says we will follow the Jews everywhere. All right, this is speaking at the end of days, they will not escape us. They will not be able to escape us. Okay, the rock and tree will speak according to the hadith. That's a uh, oral tradition of Muhammad's uh, 
uh, sayings. It's not actually written sayings that they have. And it is a reliable promise from the prophet, he says. I guess he doesn't realize the Vatican wrote all that. It was actually the, the monks up in northern Africa that wrote for Muhammad uh, while he was in the demonic trances. Kaji, his own wife, stated he would go into like a demonic trance. That's what she said. You take it up with her. All right. So it goes on to say here, according to which the tree and the rock will speak and say, O Muslim, there is a Jew behind me. Come and kill him. Oh, oh, Muslim, there's a Jew behind me. Come and kill him. Is anybody not familiar with the biblical account? And I'm sure, seeing that um, uh, the, the, the Muslim people believe that Moses was truly a prophet of God. I know they do. I've read uh, parts of the Quran already myself. They do believe this. And Moses actually writes that the author, uh, or Satan, is the author of death. He's the one that, he's the one, that, the Bible says that, that Satan was a murderer from the beginning. God doesn't go around murdering people, but the devil does. And you know, it's funny, the Pope of Rome, the Vatican took and, and has tried to force Israel to indict, prosecute, and convict, this is even without a trial, the Jewish man that spoke publicly in, in, in a meeting there in Israel there, uh, I forget the man's name. I did have it up yesterday. I was looking at the article. I didn't know if I'd bring it up in this tonight or not, but I, but I am going to go ahead and bring it up. But they actually indicted him. And um, let me, let me I, I've got the, or, or, they, 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 they did arrest him. Let me real quick pull it up. Uh, Jewish rabbi. Okay, now he was saying that all the churches that were in... Um, that, they're, that they are actually altars to Baal. I agree with him on that. That's exactly what they are in Israel. You know, I, now I'm not saying that every one of them do. I'm talking about all the ones that have the idols in them. All of them, all of them are out there having people bow and, you know, like the, what they call the Holy Sepulcher right there in the old city. It's nothing but an altar to Baal. Burn incense to Baal and everything else. People come down and bow before statues. I've actually got a video there of a man sitting there with a statue of Mary praying and crying his heart out to her. Now, do I believe that man's sincere? Sure, I believe he's sincere. You know, my heart goes out to these people that are in that kind of condition. Now, I don't condone going out and burn a church, but this, this rabbi right here, uh, uh, Gopstein is his name, he actually had said that they, they should all be uh, destroyed. I don't know if he said burned or how he actually put it there in the article that, that he did this on originally, but he, he believed in the destruction of them. And later he, he refines his own statement and saying, I'm not talking about go out there and do it. I'm just saying it, because it is an altar to Baal that it should be destroyed. And quite frankly, God will do that himself. We, we don't have to worry about doing it. Jewish people, let me tell you something, my brother and sisters out there. Do not, you, one, don't end up lowering yourselves to the terrorist standards. And, I, and I, when I say this, let me do say this clearly. Not all Muslims and not all Arabic people are terrorists. Many of them just want to live, and, they, and, they, and they, they, they believe what they believe. They have a right to believe what they want to believe, but they just want to live in peace. But there is a minority that is a complete radical bunch of maniacs that are terrorists that will not stop at anything. All these knife attacks that are going on in Israel, these are suicide attackers. I say suicide because they know, they watch the news, they see that practically every one of these people that go out and perpetrate these crimes, or at least 50% of them, are being killed by the police. So you've got to have the mindset that you're willing to die to go out just so you can kill a Jew. That's ridiculous. That's total insanity and demonic of the devil. Now, the Vatican insisted that this man be arrested, prosecuted, Forget the trying. The Vatican didn't care about him being tried. They wanted him prosecuted and put in jail. They didn't even care about him having a trial. His own, his own attorney even made the statement, is the Pope going to come here and be his judge as well? You know, the, the, his, his own defense attorney could not believe the audacity that the Vatican had that much power over the Israeli government that they went and arrested this man because he made a statement. All right, well, if they arrested him, can you tell me then why the Vatican is so prejudiced 
and they don't do nothing about this Muslim cleric right here that is calling on all Jews to be killed. He's right there on the Temple Mount. Why doesn't the Vatican cry out to have him arrested? He's inciting murder. And he's not just saying it as a, as a principle of what he believes. And the other man, he's not talking about murder either. He wasn't even talking about, uh, Gobstein was not talking about murder. He was just talking about that it was altars to Baal. And the Vatican was inflamed over that. Wanted, it, wanted his organization banned you can't buy or sell saving you take the mark. Come on, let's wake up, friends. You need to wake up on this. You can't buy or sell. You can't speak. You have no voice except you go along with whatever the Vatican has to say. But, oh, the Muslim cleric, he can say what he wants. It's okay for him, right? Oh, Muslim, there is a Jew behind me. Come and kill him. I thought it was a religion, religion of peace. You know, and I know that there's Muslim people that do want peace, that, that, do, that, are, that are clerics, that believe their way. I totally disagree with their way. I tell you like it is, it's no different than the Vatican to me. They're both wrong and both completely in idolatry. The children of Israel will all be exterminated, he says. Okay? The Antichrist will be killed. And the Muslims will live in comfort for a long time. Okay, that's what he says there. Palestinian Media Watch, Pal Watch is what it's actually called. All right, friends, I, I, I'm uh, alarmed to say the very least that this man gets away with it, you know. Well, I shouldn't be alarmed. It's the way they all do, you know. As long as uh, uh, the Vatican approves of what they're saying, they can do whatever they want. No big deal. And let me pull Psalm 83 up for you real quick on the screen here. Um, it is a confederacy that's going on between the churches, the Arabic nations, the religious leaders of these nations, as well as the heads of states of these nations. And I recently um, really, by God's grace, seen what's been going on here and I felt that you guys needed to be made more aware of the things that are happening. And now I've been looking at the relationship that the Vatican has with Iran. It's a very important situation that's going on here because in light of what this man says in, in the video that I just shared with you, um, and that is that, um, let me just pull that back to where that's at and I'll stop it because I really want you to be able to see this. All right, the, let me back it up a little further. Okay. Um, because they're planning on building the temple. Okay, they'll be forced to change their plans to build the temple inside the structure of the Al-Aqsa Al Mosque. Okay, now he goes on to say, um, and we'll have to build it outside the Al-Aqsa Mosque. So he's clearly showing you that they, he knows they're going to build the third temple. It's going to be built there on the Temple Mount. Uh, I guess what he's trying to say in his statement here is that they would tear down the Al-Aqsa Mosque and build the third temple, but then he states here, and we'll have to build it outside the Al-Aqsa Mosque. All right? And I think the next statement here, Okay, he just says a temple of heresy to worship the devil. All right, so he clearly knows that they're going to build the third temple. He knows it's going to be built on the Temple Mount, and he knows that they're going to build it on the outside of the Al-Aqsa Mosque. All right, this is clear what we have established right here on that there. All right, now, um, I bring this in here because in doing some research on, uh, you know, after seeing what his statement was, I went back and looked at this because he spoke about the Antichrist and I thought that was interesting, and I'd run across an article the other day that spoke about how that Ahmadinejad, and of course this has been some time back now, back in 2006 in December, when he first made this comment here, uh, and this is the headline on WND News, it says, Jesus, Mahadi, both coming, says Iran's Ahmadinejad. All right, many, many people, let me tell you something, this is what gets me about prophecies too, so many people thought that he was the Antichrist, it wasn't funny. 
And I kept saying back then when people would say that, I'm, I'm like, come on, seriously, do you think this man is going to be able to bring about a one world religion? No, it's impossible. But his statement and the confederacy that's happening with Psalm 83 is clearly showing what the Pope of Rome was doing even then. All right, so before I read the article, let me take you back to the scripture real quick. Let's look at this, and I hope you guys can see this on your screen there. I've tried several different ways to make this bigger, and I just don't know any other way to make it larger. Okay, uh, a, song of, uh, a psalm of Asaph, Keep not thou silent, O God, hold not thy peace. Be not still, O God, for lo, thine enemies make atonement. They that hate thee have lifted up the head. They have taken crafty a counsel against thy people and consulted against thy hidden ones. All right, now, one, let, me, let me. there's one thing I need to do here. Hang on, guys. Let's just, I can get you a better view of the Bible. Those of you that like to look at the Hebrew as well, the memory online is a, is, a, is a good source. It's a decent translation. I don't consider it the best, but it is a decent translation. Uh, and that's, of course, that's my opinion. It doesn't, my opinion doesn't mean that it's the right way. It's just my thought on it. Okay. Shir mizmor la asaf. Okay. A song or, or a psalm of asaf. O God, keep thou not silence, hold not thy peace, and be not still, O God. Okay. Israel is seeking God to intervene on an issue. So we have to see what the issue is. For lo, thy enemies are in an uproar, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. Now the head here, the rosh, is a, it's the leader. All right? Nasu rosh. See, they've lifted up their leader. All right? They hold crafty converse against thy people. That's actually like a council meeting like the United Nations. If you look at this, if you apply this the way that, that is, is spoken about in modern day Hebrew, al-Ahmad, uh, sod, this is like the United Nations Assembly. This is the type of meeting this would be in, all right? They, they have taken crafty uh, converse or counsel, it says in King James, I believe it is, against thy people and taken counsel against thy treasured ones. Okay, so tzofanecha, is actually in Hebrew, Tzofanecha, which is the last word on the on line four uh, under Dalet there. Tzofanecha is hidden ones, treasured ones. You could use the word treasured, but the word hidden ones is actually better. King James did a little bit better job in translating that. They have said, come let us cut them off from being a nation. Of course, I, you guys already know, I believe the hidden ones are the two witnesses. It says, come let, them, let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. See, now the Vatican started that issue with the name of Israel when they actually took, uh, at, the, at, the, at the fall of uh, Israel uh, in 70 AD, they changed the name, they called it Palestine. The, the, the Roman Catholic Church has maintained the name Palestine. They give this to the Palestinians, the, the Jordanian Arabs that were living in the land at the time, uh, when Israel took and battled in 1948. So it, the Vatican has always tried to do away with the name of Israel, constantly. Even in all their dialects, still, they try to do away with the name of Israel. And of course, the Arabic nations that they're joining with totally want to do away with the name of Israel as well. Now, if you go on in verse 6 here, uh, For they have consulted together with one consent against thee, do they make a covenant. All right? A covenant right there. See, barit. Uh, alecha barit. Ikaroto, uh, Kikrotu, excuse me. All right, the Brit is a covenant that they have made. They're, they're, uh, I think King James uh, translate that as confederate. They're confederate against, uh, against thee. All right, the tents of Adam and the Ishmaelites. Okay, the tents of Adam, Edom, as we say in Hebrew. The, the tents are the churches, the World Council of Churches. It also could very well be, as I've said before, it could be Russia in this case here because Vladimir Putin is a Russian Orthodox uh, Catholic. He also, we've already seen that the Vatican and the Russian Orthodox Church have united together and they've worked out their, their, their differences. And now we see Vladimir Putin there in uh, Syria of all places with no confrontation by the United States, which is kind of ironic because Russia is bombing and destroying all of the forces that the United States and the CIA were backing and arming. And believe me, they have backed and armed them with some pretty hefty weapons. And uh, recently, Brother Chris sent me an article there showing that the, also that the United States had pulled out one of its aircraft carriers from the Mediterranean 
you know, it's as if the United States does not want to get involved in this, and, and at the same time, the United States is trying to save face now and finally taking out some of the ISIS targets when they've spent all these years now doing nothing. All right, so anyway, so I believe that Russia is part of these tents here. Now, then it goes on to say, and the Ishmaelites, Moab, the Hagarines, Gibal, Ammon, Amalek, Philistia, and the, and the inhabitants of Tari, Assyria, also is joined with them, or Syria, which shows Syria comes in last. Why? They've got to rebuild Syria. They've got to make Syria strong again. And of course, why is Russia there? They want the oil in the, in the area there. We know that all these names that you see here are dealing with the countries of Lebanon, the countries of Jordan, uh, of course, Syria. Egypt is mentioned in here as one of these countries as well. We've been over all this before with you. They're all Confederate. Even the Iranians are part of this group here. All right? So... This is what's going on. So we see that we have a biblical issue that is taking place right there when we look at that. All right. Now, so that's that's just looking at the scriptural side of it. And then what we have here is uh, Amajinadad comes in here and he makes this very strange statement. WND News carried it as on uh, December 19, 2006, in a, in a greeting to the world's Christians for the coming new year. Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad said he expects both Jesus and the Shiite messianic figure, the Iman Mahdi, that would be the 12th Mahdi, to return and wipe away oppression. Are you serious? He expects Jesus to return. Now, this is another reason why there was so much fuel behind this where people believe that it's an Arabic Antichrist. Well, a lot of the Arabs believe it's a Jewish Antichrist. But you're going to have the Antichrist and the false prophet working hand in hand in this. But it's interesting that he brings up Jesus. Why, why do you even bring this up to begin with? Because he's working with the Pope of Rome. And if you want to look at the part about Jesus, it's not really that Jesus that comes back, but Antichristo, just like the word vicar of Christ, is a substitute for the real Mashiach, the real Christ. And so what is it? It's really going to be a pontiff of Rome that, that will be that Antichristo. doesn't make any difference. I, I personally do not think that Pope Francis will retire, but that's, I'm not prophesying that. But nonetheless, even if he did, Satan will just take the next man that comes in line. It makes no difference. All right? He goes on to say, uh, I wish all Christians oh, a happy new year. To ask them a question as well, and Amajinadad, according to the Iranian student news agency reported, uh, cited by Ynet News, my one question from Christians is, what would Jesus do if he were present in the world today? What would he do before some of the oppressive powers in the world who are in fact residing in Christian countries? Which powers would he revive and which of them would he destroy? Ask the Iranian leader. You notice the decline of the United States since then? Of course, the decline of the United States has only been since Russia came down to Syria. And it's interesting how Russia can wield the power that they're wielding as if it's no big deal. The Vatican's not condemning what Russia's doing. It's because the Vatican is behind Russia and what they're doing. All right? He says, if Jesus were, Jesus were present today, who would be facing him and who would be following him? Ahmadinejad then made a connection between Jesus and the Iman Mahdi, believed by Shias to have, have disappeared as a child in AD 941. When the Mahdi returns, they contend he will reign on earth for seven years before bringing about a final judgment and the end of the world. All I want to say is that the age of hardship, threat, and spite will come to an end someday, and God willing, Jesus would return to the world along with the emergence of the descendants of Islam's holy prophet, Iman Mahdi, and wipe away every tinge of oppression, pain, agony from the face of the world, Ahmadinejad is quoted as saying. you got to be kidding me. Now, friends, this is, this, is, this is a major issue here. And the reason why I'm going back in the history and bring these things up for you is so you can understand how... The relationship has been building between Rome. Remember, the Psalm 83 says they've lifted up their head, their leader. They've raised up their leader. And all the Arabic nations have rallied in behind the Pope of Rome. 
And you're going to see exactly why, okay? We're going to look at that in just a moment here. All right, let's look at this article here as well. Time, uh, Time ma Magazine Online reports here, Iran's secret weapon. This was on November 26, 2007. Makes you wonder, do they, do they end up doing these meetings with the Pope secretly when the world really doesn't know? Because why is it that the meeting, right after, right after such bold statements are made, then, then there's diplomatic relationships suddenly with these countries. So their secret weapon is the Pope. Let's look at what the article says here. The dip diplomatic chess game around Iran's nuclear program includes an unlikely bishop, according to several well-placed Roman sources. Iranian officials are quietly laying the groundwork necessary to turn Pope Benedict XVI and top Vatican diplomats for a mediation if the showdown with the United States should escalate towards a military intervention. The 80-year-old Pope has thus far steered clear of any strong public comments about either Iran's failure to fully comply with UN nuclear weapons inspectors or drumbeat of war coming from some corners in Washington. But Iran, which has had diplomatic relationships with the Holy See for, for, for 53 years, may be trying to line up Benedict as an ace in the hole for staving off potential attack in the coming months. Well, it did work, didn't it? All right. The Vatican seems to be part of their strategy, a senior Western diplomat in Rome said on the Iranian leadership. They have an idea of when the 11th hour is coming and they know an intervention of the Vatican is the most open and amendable route to Western public opinion. It could buy them time. Let me tell you something. I'm kind of, I'm going to, this is just something that comes on my heart right now to share with you. And I don't, I'm not saying this is prophecy. I don't really know what this means. When they build the third temple, especially if the Pope of Rome has a hand in this temple going back up, and if the Arab nations have a hand in it as well, it may end up being well, I've, I've made this, let me say it like this here. I've made this statement already. They're going to fake a millennial reign. They believe that the third temple will be a place for all nations to come and worship before the Lord. Well, that temple comes down out of heaven, friends. It doesn't come by us building it here on the earth. And I actually have to differ with, with Mark Biltz on this. I did have a, just a brief discussion with him. I'd like to put more information to, to Mark on this. Mark believes that sacrifices are to be reinstituted, and he even believes that Jesus will do it. Now, you may think that's far-fetched. I got Mark's email where he told me this. He, and he told me, he says, I, I believe you take it wrong. I, I, I shared with him Isaiah 66, where the Bible clearly says to take and kill an ox as if you killed a man. And we didn't go any further with it, but I do want to speak to him more about this. So what, what's going to happen here on the Temple Mount? I believe they are going to build a third temple. But if the Vatican has anything to say about it, it's going to be united with Christian worship as well. Remember what John's prophecy says? The outer court is given unto the Gentiles. All right, that's Revelation. Let's take a quick look at that. All right, in, in the book of Revelation, and uh, that's uh, chapter 11, I believe it is, and there was given me a reed like a rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. Remember, I shared with you guys not too long ago about this very scripture here that the Temple Institute had already been drawing up plans. Now, of course, some people who wrote me and said they've done, this has been done for several years now, but they finally had made it more of a public issue, did a major video. This was after they had, they had got themselves a red heifer, was raising it in Israel, and then they put the video out showing also the, the 3D uh, dimensional view of what the temple would look like. All right? Now, I told you then, I believe, that the very things that they were doing was the fulfillment of Revelation 11.1. He was giving me a reed likened to a rod. See, what, what, what does an architect use? He has a measuring stick. He's measuring the temple where it's laid out. 
Then it says, But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot for forty and two months. Now, all the way back to, to um, gosh, I don't know, 2011 or something like that, when I first started doing YouTube videos there, one of the main things that I said then is, what is this all about? Why, what is this about the outer court? This is Rome gets this. They're using the Palestinians, according to Daniel chapter 11, they come up strong with a small people. They're using the Palestinian people, the so-called Arabic people that they give the name the Palestinians to, they use, or they're using them to against Israel. This is why they had to create a state out of these people here. Because they, the Pope of Rome needs East Jerusalem. You notice they, they only want East Jerusalem. Now, the, the Palestinians want all of it. The Pope don't care if he gets all of it. He just needs East Jerusalem. Why? So they can build that third temple. And in the vision that God showed me, there was some type of temple that was built on the Temple Mount and God told me there was a man drinking on his holy mountain, and I was actually over on Mount Zion, but I knew that the people were getting ready to go up to the temple, but for some reason, I didn't see the building physically, but for some reason, I knew in that vision that they were actually going up to a church and not a temple of Israel. So, that's why I say, are they going to fake a millennial reign? Very well probably could do that. We do know that in the temple itself, Solomon's temple, the outer court was for the Gentiles. Now this one here is saying, measure it not for it's given unto the Gentiles. The Palestinians are going to get East Jerusalem's friends. Why? For the, for the sake of Rome. Rome's already gotten, uh, they've already gotten some of the outer court now. They actually got the, all of Mount Zion now. The Temple Mount was handed over to the Jordanians to control it, for the Palestinian people. Now, will there be an agreement over the building of the third temple? I, I don't know what the deal is it's going to be, but I guarantee you one thing, it's going to have a Christian twist to it. And I'm not against my Christian brothers and sisters, believe me, I understand that. And, and I would never be against a temple that's just for a house of worship. But it's not going to be used for that purpose at all. That's one reason why I say the cleric at the Al-Aqsa Al Mosque is right. The Antichrist is going to come to that temple. All right? Now, so let's go back. Let's take a look at what it says here. They have a secret weapon. It's the Pope. The diplomatic chess game around Iran's nuclear program includes an unlikely bishop. We got into that already, right? They've had that relationship for 53 years now. The Vatican seems to be part of their strategy, a senior Western diplomat in Rome said of the Iranian leadership. They have an idea of when the 11th hour is coming, and they know an intervention of the Vatican is the most open and amiable route to Western public opinion. It could buy them time. Western opinion. The Vatican controls the West. You know, there was a time where the early people in America said, don't ever let a pope come to the United States. The early uh, forefathers of America, but well, they, you, the Vatican owns the United States now. If the situation heats up in the coming months, the question exactly what role the Vatican would play and could become pivotal, says one high-ranking Vatican official. The Iranians look to the Holy See with particular attention. It is born from our common religious matrix. Whoa. Are you serious? They have a common religious matrix. Of course they do. This could be utilized to offer ourselves as an intermediary if the crisis worsens. Among the potential moves, a forceful series of public appeals by the Pope, a Vatican emissary sent to Washington and Tehran on a, on a visit to the Vatican by Iranian President, Pre, uh, President uh, Mahmoud uh, uh, Ahmadinejad. Do you guys realize who controls the world? Why is the Pope of Rome the mediator with everything? Every single world crisis, he's the mediator. And everybody says that only peace can come by the Pope itself. So, so Jesus never brought peace, only the Pope brings peace. Is that what you're trying to tell me? Let me tell you something here, and this is from, and, I, and, I, and I'm only going to be able to paraphrase it because I don't have it in front of me here. Rabbi Tobias Singer, and I know Rabbi Tobias Singer, 
he actually spoke and stated his condemnation against Jesus was that peace was never restored to Israel. He said, so therefore he could not be Mashiach. So let me ask this, Rabbi Singer, and, and, and I appreciate, I love my brother, but I want to ask you the question. If the Pope of Rome ends up bringing peace to the Middle East for you, will he be your Mashiach? Now, I know you wouldn't believe it, okay, so I'll, I'll answer it for you. But the point is then, how many people might believe it that are Jewish as a result? There's your danger. There's your danger. But you have to remember, we're already seeing, though, right here in this the article itself, he says here, it is born from a common religious matrix. This is what the Vatican has with the Muslim people. The Iranians, whoever you want to call it, but it's what they have. They have it with both political and religious sections of Iran and all the other Muslim nations. That's why they have the two keys. They're the head of both political and religious powers of the world. All right? Now, next paragraph. Located in a leafy Roman, Rome neighborhood, the Iranian embassy to the Holy See features an entryway lined with a large photograph of Ayatollah uh, Rahola Khomeini and framed centuries-old correspondence between popes of the Persian monarchs, including a November 16, 1561 letter in Latin from Pope Pius V to Shah Tahmaspa I, the current number two official at the embassy, Vice Ambassador Ahmed, uh, Ahmed Faima, said that despite some concern last year about the Pope's prov provocative speech about Islam, in uh, Regensburg, Germany, relations between Iran and the Holy See are very good. Oh, so the Pope can say it and it's okay. But let uh, a cartoonist draw a picture about Muhammad, the prophet, and you kill everybody. Remember, Satan is the one that started all the death. He was the first one. He was a murderer and a liar from the beginning. So keep that in mind when you're out there killing Jews or Christians or anybody else. Satan is the murderer. All right? So he goes on to say that last April's release of 15 British sailors held by Iran, a decision that Ahmadinejad called an Easter gift, came just day after Pope had sent a private letter asking for their liberation. There was respect for the request of the Pope, said Fahima who also cited a Rome meeting in May between Benedict and the former Iranian president, Mohammed uh, uh, Khatami. As sign of a mutual goodwill, the policy of the Holy See is important throughout the whole world, the diplomat said. Asked about the standoff with the West and over his country's nuclear program, Fahima repeated Iran's insistence that it is seeking the atomic power only for civilian purposes. Moreover, he said he doubts that the United States can resolve key re regional issues in the Middle East, including Iraq, Lebanon, without the help of Iran. We don't expect the superpower will attack, Fahima concluded, but if they do, I am sure the Holy See would, would not be favorable to such a choice. So, so do you realize what, I mean, do you realize how serious of a relationship Rome has? I mean, the article goes on. You'd catch us on on Israel, Israeli News uh, Live on our Facebook page where we'll post these articles at as well. All right. Now, the Vatican, this, this here, another, oh gosh. Um, this actually happened here in 2015. The Vatican invites Iranians to join Pope Francis in Philadelphia. A senior Vatican official said Thursday that a delegation of leading women from Iran, including one of the country's vice presidents, has been invited to be on hand when Pope Francis visits Philadelphia for the World Meeting of Families in September. Italian Archbishop Vinzino Paglia, president of the Vatican's Pontifical Council for the Family, said the ideas was born from, the, from a meeting in Rome between the delegation of the Iranian women and a group of Catholic women hosted by the office and devoted to issues concerning the family and the promotion of women. The Iranian lineup included, I uh, can't even say that name there, the country's vice president for women and family affairs who met Pope Francis Thursday morning, she said the two leaders discussed not only matters related to the family, but also the international situation, including conflicts in the Middle East and the need to join forces and the struggle against religious extremism. 
In the course of three days of conversation between the Iranians and the Catholic participants, uh, Paglia said the Iranian side suggested going to Philadelphia. He said uh, he immediately accepted the idea, extending a formal invitation for the group. The family isn't just a Catholic concern, Paglia said. It is part of the patrimony of humanity. Friends, listen to me. When we, were, when we have been looking here at Psalm 83, it is a confederacy. Esau, Edom, which is Obadiah completely. And, and maybe I should just real quick, for the sake of those that may view in this news later tonight on YouTube or whatever the case may be, let me show you so you know how Obadiah is, plays into this. This is in Obadiah, uh, only one chapter. Verse 6, how is Esau searched out? How are his hidden places sought out? Who's Esau? All right, so it's, God is going to explain who Esau is here so you know who biblically Esau is in modern days or even back then so that you would know in modern days who he is as well. All right, now if we drop down and you go into verse 11, in that day thou didst stand aloof in the day that strangers carried away his substance and foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou wast as one of them. That's, that's Esau. And they, they cast lots upon Jerusalem, and even thou wast as one of them? Are you serious? This is the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. But he's as one of them. It's said by scholars that Titus was not alone, but used the Syrian army and other armies in that region at that time to help the, to, to defeat the Jews. And some scholars, like Chuck Misser, actually suggest that Titus was more of a bystander. Well, according to Obadiah, that's exactly right. But watch what God says about it. But thou shouldest not have gazed on the day of thy brother in the day of his disaster, Thy brother, that, well, you know it's Esau because Esau and Jacob are brothers. All right? Neither shouldst thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. Neither shouldst thou have spoken proudly in the day of the distress. Thou shouldst not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Yea, thou shouldst not have gazed on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. The Ark of Titus. Is that right? The Ark of Titus is right there in Rome. Again, Esau, Adam, he is a Roman. Titus, the Roman general. See? For in the day of the Lord is near upon all nations, as, as thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy dealing shall return upon thine own head. God's going to bring judgment on Rome for this. And they of the south shall possess the Mount of Esau, and they of the low land, the, the Philistines. And they, they shall possess the field of Ephraim, and the field of Samaria, and Benjamin shall possess Gilead. All right? It does go into, if you go to verse 16, this is where you find out also who it is in modern days, because it says here, For as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, That's masculine plural right there. Shin tav yod tav mem. Masculine plural. When the Pope of Rome in 2014 had their mass there at the upper room just above King David's tomb on Mount Zion, God's holy mountain, it says it in verse 17, but in Mount Zion there shall be those that escape. All right? It was men only in that first communion service. But then he goes on to say, right after he says that, uh, he makes the next statement there. Ishatu kol hagoim tamid. All right, and they shall continue, the nations here, but it's actually the, the Gentiles, uh, the, uh, the Gentiles shall, all, all the Gentiles shall continually drink. All right, Ishatu, that's gender inclusive. And they continued, and they've been doing it ever since, doing communion services, the Catholic churches there, the different forms of Catholic churches, doing communion services, both men and women there in the upper room, and even had the audacity to do it in David's tomb. Friends, Rome is Esau. So it's, it's clear to say what Psalm 83 is all about. And now we've been watching the Confederacy being built. I shared with you in another news broadcast all the groups that they've done there. Russia is in Syria. Russia wants the oil fields. Russia has come to take a spoil. Now, some people have been saying to me, you know, Steve, do you believe that this is actually the Gog uh, Gog of Magog war, or Gog and Magog, as some people call it there. Uh, I can't say that it is as of yet on that there. But clearly, in Zechariah chapter 14 even, uh, 
we're seeing that. We're seeing mica as well. Uh, and it looks more that it could be like Zechariah chapter 14. As he says here, Behold, a day of the Lord cometh when thy spoil shall be divi excuse me, divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, but the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. See, they go into captivity. Now, if you remember what Micah says, he says, You shall go forth out of the city and dwell in the fields. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fighteth in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in the day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, on the Mount of Olives, which shall cleft in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, so that there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south. Keep in mind, that's only four verses there. But th those four verses can fulfill in, within themselves weeks, months, and even a year, two, or three apart with no problem. When it says there that um, when they, verse 1, when, they, when, when thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee, that's what they're doing right now. And soon Hezbollah will attack from the north, will join into it, Hamas will attack. Right now the Intifada is to totally disrupt the entire region, to bring all the soldiers, to gather them into one place so that, that next Hezbollah can attack from the north, the Iranians can attack from the other side there. Russia will give them cover so the United States doesn't come in and stop anything before they can get a hold of the, 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 the Golan, so they can get the Golan back into Syrian hands before the 1967 war, and so that uh, they can force the Jews to accept the Palestinian state, and they will take East Jerusalem. It will become an international city, and only the Jews that will stay in that city there is the ones that they want to stay in that city. It's coming, friends. It's coming. But God, it says here, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half the city shall go forth into captivity. That's how bad the battle's going to be. But God will intervene. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fighteth in the day of battle. How long will the battle last before God intervenes? I'm not sure. But he will intervene. Friends, it's a very, very serious hour that we're living in. Very serious hour. This man right here, this Sheikh uh, Khalid al Magharabaf, is the one that teaches twice a week in the Al Aqsa Mosque. And he's the one that is claiming that there's going to be a third temple on the Temple Mount, and he claims that they won't build it where the Al-Aqsa Mosque is, but they'll be forced not to build it inside, he says, the structure of the Al-Aqsa Mosque, and will have to build it outside the Al-Aqsa Mosque. He's also calling on the violence, just like uh, the, uh, from, the, uh, from Gaza, the other cleric that we showed you the video of the other day, teaching the people how to stab and kill. Again, does the Pope of Rome call for that man to be put in prison? No, because it's Jews. See, the Catholic Church is just like they were with Hitler. The Pope Pius, uh, back in, in the days when Hitler was there, when Pope Pius became, became the Pope and sided with Hitler, they didn't care about the Jews. They still don't care about the Jews. And I pray Lori Cardoza more. She's been a friend for a long time, but I pray Lori will wake up and realize that, that the Vatican does not care one ounce about the Jewish people. Now, she does. She loves the Jewish people. She's Jewish herself, but Rome doesn't. That's one thing I do appreciate about, um, about my good friend there. Um, then lost my thought on who I was going to say there. So, oh, gosh. Anyway, there's some people that do stand for the Jewish people and know that Rome is certainly an enemy of Israel. Friends, stand with Israel with everything you got. Remember, they're blinded right now. And some people criticize me when I say that Jews don't go to hell because they're not out there confessing that Jesus Christ is their Messiah when they die. Let me just clarify that for you. 
I believe that the blood of Jesus Christ atones for those Jews because their eyes are blind. Did he not say himself, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing? Maybe that's something that you're missing right there. This is why I don't believe that they go to hell, because he actually pardoned them for what they did. And so the Jews down for the last 2,000 years it just did not know him. They did not recognize him. I'm not talking about the ones that are out there murdering and killing and stealing and cheating and doesn't care anything, but I'm talking about the ones that were trying to live a clean life before God. I believe that the blood of Jesus Christ has atoned for them because God does say in his word, if they don't know it, will he not consider the thoughts and intents of the heart? That's what I'm talking about, friends. You see, it's still the blood of Jesus Christ that saves them. I do believe that 100%. I didn't change on that. It's just I don't send everybody to hell. If you send, if you send the Jews to hell for that, you have to send the children to, to hell as well. Because the same principle applies to children. If they're not old enough to confess that Jesus Christ is their Messiah, does not his blood atone for them if they die as children? Most Christians would believe that, but you've actually got some legalists that say, no, that they won't. They go to hell too. That's nonsense. And you know it's nonsense. Anyway, friends, if this news broadcast is a blessing to you, we do need your support. We try not to ask very often and haven't asked in a while. But if you, this is a blessing to you, we need your support to make this happen. We are changing our address in the United States. We, are, we will be updating our website very soon. Uh, of course, if you do still send it there, that's at uh, Sister Lisa. She's been very precious, her and Brother Don, and faithful to um, caring for that when people send it by check by mail. But we figured out a way to be able to do electronic deposits, so we want to take burden off of our precious sister and brother there. And you'll be able to send it to Europe. This is where we stay probably 60% of the time and the other parts in Israel but it's easier to come here than it is to go to Israel. So we'll be updating that address change for you as well. And those that like to give online, you can go to IsraeliNewsLive.org or IsraelReturns.com. Thank you and God bless you. We love you. Shalom.